Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What can be done to bring peace to Syria, Yemen, the Gaza Strip, and Israel? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other important issues. Welcome back to our program. You're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would encourage our viewers to go to www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to take a look at some of our previous shows and also to perhaps make recommendations for future topics and future guests. Today we're taking a look at one of the most turbulent areas of the world and that is the Middle East. If you look at just about every country in the Middle East, or the vast majority of them, there are major problems to be dealt with. My guest today is an expert on the Middle East. My guest today is Dr. Robert Olson. Dr. Robert Olson is a retired professor of Middle East history and politics at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky, USA. Professor Olson is the co-founder of the Kurdish Studies Center in the United States. He received the Best Book Award from the Third World Studies Association in 1999 and 2000. Dr. Bob Olson, welcome to today's Global Connections program. It's a pleasure to be here, Bill. I appreciate you being back with me today. Let's talk about the Middle East. We could spend probably two days talking about it, but let's go right into one of the major challenges, and that is to perhaps derail, if there is an uh, interest on the part of the Iranians to develop nuclear capabilities, especially a nuclear bomb, not talking about peaceful uh, nuclear capabilities, but there's been an agreement that was cracked by the P5 plus one. First off, who are the P5 plus one, and what was the main thrust of this agreement, uh, very briefly? Well, the, P the P5 plus one are the national, uh, the national Security Council at the United Nations of Britain, <clears throat> Britain, France, the United States, Russia, and China, and the one is Germany. Uh, and they came to this agreement on the 14th of, uh, uh, of June uh, re regarding Iran's nuclear program. And it seems to be a very good agreement. Uh, I think one thing that attests to uh, why it's very much in the interest of the United States that over 110 American diplomats, some of the top ones of the last 50 years of the United States, all the most distinguished ones agreed with it. 60 of the national security uh, former uh, advisors in the United States, including Zygmunt Brzezinski, Henry Kissinger, and so forth. Uh, agree, agreed with it, as well as, uh, as, well as many uh, other uh, national security people in Europe. And of course, all of the members of the, uh, uh, the European members of the P5 plus one, they're very much in favor of it. So I think, it's, uh, I think it very much serves the American national security interest. Mm, exactly. And the, the main thrust of that whole agreement, there was one goal, and that was to make sure that the Iranians did not develop nuclear capabilities. That was the goal. But a lot of the people who have looked at this agreement, as you said, some of the most, some of the, the really the most brilliant minds in foreign policy came out in, in favor of the agreement. But some people have been bringing in ancillary issues like saying that these Americans who are held in an Iranian prison should be released or that Iran should agree not to back Hezbollah. Those were all ancillary issues that had no chance and should not even be in the agreement, should they? Uh, no, I, I don't think I, I don't think they should be, because the agreement is is mostly concerned with Iran's newly emerging and strengthened geopolitical position in the United States. I think that most scholars of the Middle East, at least the people that I know in my field, agree that Iran could make nuclear weapons. It's capable of it. It's often said they're on the threshold of uh, of making these. Uh, but I think the important reason for the agreement is is to. Uh, is to prevent Iran from doing that through the other 
uh, uh, through the other things they're going to be granted, like a, a, normali a normalization of their relations with the United States, with the European countries. You can already see it's been very effective because you've had 150 strong uh, uh, trade uh, delegations go from France uh, to Tehran. Germany with 151 is going mm -hmm. in, uh, in October. And I just read yesterday that George Osborne, who's the Chancellor of the Exchequer in Great Britain, is going to, uh, going to go to Tehran with perhaps 300 people. So it shows you they're very much in favor. Of it. They think it's, it's in their interest and an interest in Iran, and more particularly, that's very much in their interest as far as the Middle East is concerned with regard to Iraq and to Syria, especially Syria. And we see that very clear now with the great exodus of migrants from the Middle East, particularly Syria again, to Europe, which is causing Europe many, many problems and even a little bit destabilizing for the EU. Exactly. And of course, the proponents of this agreement say that this is one of the most intrusive as far as monitoring agreements ever been developed. It also reduces the, the, the uh, centrifuges that the Iranians have. It will also have a snapback provision, as I understand it, that, that if Iran does not comply with the agreement, then the sanctions, uh, the United Nations sanctions, come back online. So it seems like that there are a lot of positive aspects, and there really was no opportunity to renegotiate. Some people have said, well, we would renegotiate, but that was off the table. The Allies said, this is it. These negotiations went on for months and months and months, and this was the best deal that we were going to have, and we had to go with it, did we not? Well, yeah, as I just mentioned, you can see already that, uh, that it's uh, successful, uh, that there can't be any snapback uh, 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 sanctions, because the European powers, and including Russia and China, is very clear from recent developments in the Middle East, Putin is at the United Nations today, that they uh, agree with that. Uh, and uh, so it's not in, in Iran's, and also it's not in Iran's interest to do so because they want to better their relations with all of those European uh, countries mm -hmm. as well as with China and Russia for their own uh, economic welfare. They've made that, that clear that the economy is their top priority and everything indicates that Iran very much need that. They're a country of, of 80 million people. Uh, you have 40% of the population 30 years uh, old and younger. So all, they, they, they have a lot of domestic uh, political uh, considerations to, uh, to, to make regarding the stability of the Iranian regime. So all of this augurs very well, I think, for the success of the regime, um, for the success of the agreement. Mm -hmm. It certainly is. And of course, it's not a difficult, it's not an easy issue to deal with. Some of the experts have indicated that the only option, if this agreement did not go into effect, that Iran was sitting on the precipice of developing a nuclear weapon within, I've heard, two to six months, eight months, nine months out. But if that is indeed true, which very well may be, it seems like the Iranians really wanted this agreement, even though it puts them in a tighter box and does not allow them to develop their nuclear, nuclear capabilities. Because if they were sitting on the precipice, they could have moved forward with it, could they not have? Oh yes, they could have, and 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 they wanted because, as I mentioned, for the for for their economy, uh, for uh, their integration into the Middle East and into the whole uh, concert of comity among uh, among uh, nations, uh, with India, with with China, with Russia, with whom they all have good relations, so, and therefore for the stability of the regime, they have to consider the possibility of unrest as well. After all, most people remember that in 2009, there, the regime was severely tested, very severely tested by the Green Revolution. That's high in their minds. And so I think this is one of the most motivating factors as to why they wanted this agreement. Mm, exactly. And the, the last thing we need is a war, <laughs> another war in the Middle East, especially with Iran, because Iran does have an army. Iran it, it has, a, a, as I understand it, a fairly... Uh, well-armed army, <laughs> and so they, we do not need to go to, to war the way we did in Iraq back in 2003, March of mm. 2003. And of course, the media, a large part of the media, did not pay attention to this. They ignored the experts like Hans Blix from the United Nations who said Saddam Hussein did not have weapons of mass destruction. We saw that members of the, uh, the administration at the time, Vice President Cheney and many others, were putting out false information about the buildup to the war in Iraq. And so we would hope that we're not making the same mistake today when you hear the drums of war beating of people saying, well, we need to go and deal with this militarily. We'll have 
bunker buster bombs and that type of thing. That didn't work then and has even less of a chance to work today. Well, that's absolutely true, Bill. And uh, Iran is not Iraq in many ways. And one of the most important ways beside it, it's, you know, it's a country as large as all of Europe. Uh, France, Germany, uh, Belgium, all those countries put together, it's larger. It has uh, 80 million people. But the big difference with Iraq is that it has, al it has allies or partners in all of those reasons. In Iraq, it's the st uh, strongest country in Iraq now because uh, uh, 60 or 70 percent of the Arab population of Iraq are Shia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it's very strong in Afghanistan, among the Shia in Afghanistan, which is another problem issue for the United States. It has a lot of influence also in Central Asia, which is very important for relations with China and Russia and with India, but also uh, f uh, Persian is still a very popular spoken language in, in Central Asia, and also with Turkey. I mean, the biggest two countries in, in the Middle East, the most powerful besides Egypt, but Egypt has so many problems that, uh, in Africa and dealing with its population and with the unrest, we can leave that aside, uh, are Turkey and Iran, countries each of, of 80 billion people. And now with the collapse of Iraq and Syria, uh, uh, the, it emerges that, that Turkey and Iran and Israel, all non-Arab countries, are the most important ones in the Middle East, with the exception of Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. We were talking about Iraq and we talked about Syria. We may as well just move into that area. Of course, we see where ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, has really created havoc in that area of the world. The militants have taken over parts of Iraq. They're active in Syria. They're active, I guess, in Yemen and other places in, in that area. What can be done to, I know they've rolled them back a little bit. They were on the march a year and a half, two years ago. It looked like they were going to be unstoppable, but apparently the Iraqis and some of the other forces there the Kurds and what have you, have rolled ISIS back a bit. But what can be done to deal with that military and ideological challenge in that area of the world? Well, you know, Bill, one of the most surprising things about the uh, challenge of the Islamic State, or ISIS, or ISIL, if you want to call it, is mm -hmm. because the, m most of the countries in the Middle East did, did not really have that as a high, uh, to attack them or to constrain them or to defeat them as a high priority. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been one of the most, uh, 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 has been the, the biggest contributor to, to ISIS. Some scholars estimate that maybe $25 billion or so, uh, maybe not directly by the Saudi government, by, but char Islamic charities and other things attached to the Saudi regime. The same thing can be said for the United Arab Republic regimes, the Emirati uh, uh, states have contributed immensely to it. Jordan, for example, couldn't do much because it's, uh, because it's very much tied uh, in its national security with, with Israel, which is very important to the United States, so they couldn't do anything. And, uh, and in addition to that, Turkey, a non-Arab country and a Sunni country, was supporting ISIS up until uh, of late because they wanted uh, they wanted ISIS to defeat the Kurds uh, because there's a civil war in Turkey and also in, in Syria. And so Turkey is a major Sunni country. It wanted to be a major Sunni country in the Middle East, now that Iraq and Syria were destroyed, uh, was supporting ISIS and probably still may be supporting it to some extent, according to uh, reports out of the best journalists in Turkey. And of course, they wanted to overthrow Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, Absolutely. which is a goal of the United States and several other countries. But when you look at that whole area of the world, and we see what happened in Iraq after that, basically an illegal invasion of a sovereign country. Saddam Hussein was captured, killed, left a vacuum there, the, the run up to the war and then the aftermath of the war were not handled very well. Then we look at Libya with Muammar Gaddafi. He was overthrown, and of course, NATO exceeded basically the, the mission of the, the original mission of the UN Security Council. The idea was to provide a no-fly zone, as I recall, and protect civilians under the responsibility to protect. And then Gaddafi was overthrown, was killed, and it left a vacuum there. And of course, Libya is in a total state of disarray today. That's probably an understatement, to put it uh, mildly. But what would happen? There are no, it appears there are no moderates in Syria who could fill that vacuum. If Assad went, it looks like ISIS would fill it, and that would be a far worse scenario than having Assad, would it not? Or am I missing something there? No, I think it is. In fact, is today at the United Nations, 
when the Vladimir Putin was speaking, he said that uh, we can't allow the Assad regime, from the point of view of, this, of the Russia, to be uh, defeated because that would mean that the, the forces around the Islamic State would be so strong that it would threaten the, not just the Alawiya, which are about 2.2 million in Turkey, they've been the dominant uh, party within the regime, but also the Christians. There are about 2.4 million Christians uh, in, in Syria. And we can see, we see what, uh, what ISIS and Islamic State has done to the Christians in Iraq. We see what they've done to the Yazidis and to other minority groups, uh, the rape, the pillage, the torture, and so forth. And so uh, I, think that, uh, uh, I think that not just, uh, the, uh, not just Assad, but even the United States and the Europeans agree that, uh, that a takeover of Syria by the ISIS uh, would, very, would be a dire threat to the Christians and to the, uh, and to the, to the enemies of Syria. Then, if there, as I've said, there's 4.3 or 4 mil million of them, then you really have a tremendous uh, refugee crisis on your hands. Not just 200,000, but you'd have almost five or 600,000 mm -hmm. to Europe. There already are 2 million refugees in Turkey, a million in, uh, in uh, Lebanon, and a million in Jordan. And there's also about 500,000 in the in the Kurdish area of northern Iraq. So this would just be uh, uh, this would just be exaggerated uh, if the, if uh, 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 if ISIS were to to be victorious. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons, uh, apparently, that there's so many refugees is that uh, many of the United Nations agencies, for example, the UN World Food, Food, Food Program, the UN Children's Fund, you have the UN High Commission for Refugees, which is working with 60 million refugees right now yes. at this point in time, never a number this large. But a lot of these agencies are underfunded. Countries, donors have said they're gonna give so much money they haven't done it. So they've had to cut back on their rations. I mean, if you don't have the money, the UN World Food Program can't give out food it doesn't have. But a lot of people think that if we funded those UN agencies and other groups too, at a much higher level, that would help keep people in that area and not have them move with their feet because they can see their, their life is deteriorating, their, the quality of life is deteriorating there. Why not move, at least go someplace else where you might have a 50-50 chance of surviving? But it seems like one way to do it is to start funneling more money to these aid agencies and so they can help people in their locale and help them stay, assuming that they're in a safe area, not in the middle of a war zone. But have you heard that or is that? Well, I, I think you're absolutely true, and I think that everyone agrees with what you just said, but the point is how much funding is taking place. I just read a report by uh, uh, one of the United Nations agencies, and they said they were asking for $4.2 billion. You know better than I because you just attended this United Nations mm -hmm. meeting, and only $1.2 billion or so had right. been, uh, uh, had been uh, delivered. The, the, other, the other problem is that uh, when you bring the refugees back into Syria, where are you going to bring them? Are you going to have free zones or no-fly zones? Are you going to have uh, no Islamic State zones or whatever? And this is what the neighbors around Syria are concerned with. Uh, because, for example, the Kurds, they don't want to have a, a, uh, a free zone uh, for refugees if it's controlled by Turkey, because they think Turkey will infiltrate it with their own intelligence agents or their own supporters, and then, uh, then that lessens the chance of the Kurds getting any kind of uh, self-government that they want. And so it goes uh, also with Jordan and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and others. So, uh, so it has to be done along the lines, I think, that you've suggested and what the United Nations wants is of just with no, with no zones, but stop the war and then let the United Nations humanitarian organizations do the work. And it's getting to be very, very desperate. Again, we're, winter is upon <laughs> us once again. Uh, uh, we know how many people suffer, that, suffer from that, the malnutrition. Uh, actually, hundreds of thousands, and I've just said millions of, of children, are not able to go to school, or it's very limited schooling. And mm -hmm. this uh, really uh, augurs very ill for the future of, of the Syrian people. It certainly does. And of course, our viewers, uh, mostly the UN agencies get donations from 
governments. That's how it works. They don't, the UN can't levy a tax or anything like that, but people can make individual contributions. And our viewers could go to www.wfp.org for the World Food Program to make contributions or unicef.org to make contributions or there are various ways, UNHCR for the UN High Commission for Refugees. So people can help offset these expenses, but they've just soared. They've gone through the roof <clears> and <throat> they just can't deal with them. That brings up another question I've heard lately about, here's some of these commentators on TV who in most cases know very little about what's going on in these areas, but you hear them say, where's the United Nations? Is the UN relevant today? Now, the Security Council has been paralyzed somewhat because China and Russia did not would not agree to certain resolutions coming uh, through the Security Council dealing with Assad and with Syria. But by the same token, these agencies we've been talking about, the World Food Program, the UN High Commission for Refugees, they've been on the ground in the war zone fighting, uh, not fighting, but helping people to get to safety and to keep them alive. The UN, as I see it, has never been more relevant than in probably in 70 year history. Uh, <clears throat> yes, and I just read that the World Food Program was going to be denied funds after uh, a few more months. I think they have enough till December or so. One thing that I regret when the when Pope Francis was here, which uh, the magnificent uh, uh, reception that he received, and rightfully so, and especially his emphasis upon migrants. I would I understand uh, the purposes of his visit and and the and the and the, and the straits upon him. But it would have been I would have uh, it would have been nice if he at least he would have mentioned specifically uh, the refugee problem Syria since. It's affecting all of it, uh, so many countries in the Middle East and also in in Europe. But uh, but uh, his mission, of course, was not uh, to do that. Uh, but I wish that more attention would have been drawn to it, as particularly since the United States has been so involved uh, in contributing to these crises, as you mentioned in your opening remarks with the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and also. Uh, uh, the, uh, the actions that the Europe and the United States took against the uh, the Syrian government in uh, 2011, when the uh, when the rebellion or the uprising against Assad commenced. Exactly. Well, we recently we saw this horrific battle that waged in the Gaza Strip between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, much of the Gaza Strip is still a pile of rubble because of the bombings and what have you that took place at that time. It was a horrific loss of life. What can we, uh, hardest question yet, Bob, in the last three minutes that we have, what can be done to help bring peace and stability and an agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians? That has gone on since 1948, mm -hmm. and it seems to be getting in even more difficult to deal with. What can be done? I think very little can be done. Very little can be done because uh, the United States, and Europe as well, but especially the United States, they have a very uh, strong pro-Israeli uh, foreign policy the domestic policies, uh, the well-being of Israel is so enmeshed in our political, religious, uh, and uh, civil uh, and civil culture that I think very little uh, can can be done. Uh, secondly, uh, and then you have the pro the pro-Israeli uh, crowd, the Israel, the pro-Israeli lobbies uh, and organizations are very uh, are are very uh, are very powerful. Uh, in in addition to that. Uh, uh, in, in, in addition to that, uh, you have a very right-wing government in Israel. It's very strong. Uh, some of, most of the ministers are bent on taking over the West Bank, not just, uh, not just Gaza, but also the West Bank. We see just in the last two weeks all of the demonstrations regarding the, uh, the Temple Mount or the Harami Sharif, as the, uh, as the Palestinians and the Arabs call it, and very little can be done there. Uh, in fact, as uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, the uh, the head of the Palestinian Authority is in New York t t yesterday and then today he 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 made uh, the specific uh, uh, points that uh, that uh, that uh, if the if the UN does not and the European countries the UN do not do something about uh, the uh, Temple Mount and if it's to fall strictly into uh, into Israel's hands and that they, they monitor the whole thing then this will even lead to a wider conflagration among the 1.6 billion Muslims there are in the world, in addition to the uh, migrant crisis, and uh, addition to the crisis of the war in Syria and Iraq. 
exactly. And this, so we, I'm rather pessimistic, Bill. <laughs> lots of reason to be pessimistic, too, huh? without a doubt. But this area of the world is so important, and it seems as though that we've got to get more involved in it, all of us, everybody in the world. The U.N. is knee-deep in that area right now, obviously, in many different ways, U.N. agencies and what have you. But it is so critical that we try to broker an agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians and most people think that you're going to have to have a two-state solution. A one-state solution would not work. Israel would lose its character, would lose its identity. It would probably turn into an apartheid state for all practical purposes. So the idea is to push for that at some point. But these other issues need to be dealt with, and we need to work with other partners, even though we may not like them as much as <laughs> people may want. But Dr. Bob Olson, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative Good. program. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Good to be with you. I am Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.